Sounds good. All right, we'll get started. Yes, church planting in 2022. We, uh, I'll talk a little louder. We, I mean, if you've been here, it's been an interesting <laughs> scenario. Running a hundred foot of coax cable, trying to get an antenna, many different ways to try to get the game. Still not entirely sure, but we'll get there. Um, and so uh, just as we come into worship, whether you're just tuning in online and it's been busy for you, but it's been a little chaotic around here this evening, let's just quiet ourselves, prepare to come into pres the presence of the Lord for a moment. God, we thank you. We thank you for this space. We thank you for willing hands and creative minds to try to pull off this night between wor missional community and worship and uh, trying to kick back and enjoy the game in a few minutes. But Lord, for these next few minutes, as we come into your presence, we come to the table, we come to your word, Quiet our minds, quiet our hearts to just be present with you the way you're present with us. Forgive us from being distracted. Lord, we pray that you would weed out those thorns, chase those foxes as we talked about last week, and just surrender ourselves to this moment, to this time. Lord Jesus, in our weaknesses, we know you are strong. So whatever it is that we've come in into this building limping on, the sins, the struggles, the diseases, etc., we just, we lay them at your feet. Holy Spirit, we pray for a moment to encounter you, to experience the new life you provide in Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. It is going to be a much faster moving service this evening. We're going to keep it short to try to at least enjoy the ma vast majority of the game. Uh, but we, this is a house of prayer. Isaiah calls the temple of the Lord a house of prayer for all peoples. And that is kind of this view. And so we're just going to jump right into our narrative stories and prayer time. Where have you seen God show up? Where do you need him to show up in your life? I'll just open it up for you all. Bueller, Bueller. Any? It's okay if you don't. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Anytime you're trying to deal with students, anytime you're trying to deal with someone's spiritual stories, you definitely need God to show up. Absolutely. Final call. All right, let's come to the Lord in prayer again. Father, we, uh, we just praise you for these situations you managed to f put us in. 
reconnection with family and friends and a situation to just celebrate the work that you are doing in students' lives. Um, Lord, anytime we deal with people that are close to us, anytime we deal with the depths of someone's faith and their story and the authenticity of it, God, we cry out to you. Holy Spirit, we just pray that we would hear your voice. That we wouldn't be so focused in on the right words to say or the right timing of things, the right questions to ask. We just pray for an attunement to know that leading and that voice that you have, that you provide in us to focus in on you. So Lord, we do pray. Um, we do pray over all of us as we encounter people again, as we encounter stories, as we encounter pain and struggle and celebration. Father, teach us to be people that point to the cross, but teach us to be people that also point to an empty tomb. That sins and struggles are nailed to the cross, but new life has been brought forth. Lord, we pray over the church. We pray over the people involved. We pray over our missional communities. May we continue to invest more in people's stories. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And uh, we're going to get into our scripture time. Cameron's got the first bit to start with. 23 minutes. <laughs> I can tell Miranda did this last week. It's the truth. I'm sorry. All right, Mark 5. 21 to 24, and then we'll jump to 35 to 43. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and on seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official, saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was spoken, said to this synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion and people loudly wailing and weeping. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him, but putting him all out, or putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given to her to eat. Come on, hurry up. We've got like 20 minutes. <laughs> Lord, we just pray over his words. Uh, may they be uh, few in number for David and many in the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The trouble when you turn your mic off and it falls deep into your pocket. Seriously. First world church planting. Uh, well, we've been in Mark. We're going to continue to be in Mark. This is week five, so we're in chapter five. Uh, so far, we've covered the baptism of Jesus and the call for us all to repent and believe in the gospel because the kingdom has come. We've talked to you two stories of healing, right? The man that was paralyzed, that was carried and laid at the feet of Jesus, and then the man with the withered hand who was healed on the Sabbath. Uh, last week, we talked about the parable of the sower. Uh, the call for all of us to check our own soil. Is it good, fertile soil? 
um, but also to be willing to dive deep with other people and be in it for the long haul to help till that soil. Uh, this week we get to chapter 5, and chapter 5 is three stories of healing. The first story is uh, where Jesus encounters a man that has so many demons that are possessing him, they literally call themselves legion. And when he casts them out, they go into this giant herd of pigs and drown them in the sea, and people are afraid. The man who is healed wants to go follow Jesus. Jesus tells him no, and actually commissions him back to go proclaim the gospel to the town. Jesus has uh, now come to the other side of the sea, probably back to Capernaum. Uh, and we have these sandwich stories where we get the healing of Jairus' daughter that Cameron just read, and then the healing of a woman with a blood discharge that's kind of right in between the story, literally in route uh, in between those two scenes. And so the best way to think of chapter 3 is, is in the three Ds, or chapter 5 is in the three Ds, that Jesus has power over demons, disease, and death. Um, and all of these are a foreshadowing of what his kingdom will fully be like when he returns. Uh, we've already talked about in, in chapter 1, the already not yet, that he has come, he has conquered, he is victorious, but we're waiting for that final fulfillment when he returns. And when we see it, we will see Satan be bound up and all of his demons with him. We'll see disease be no more, death will be no more, instead just eternal life. Um, and so while we await, let us dive into Mark chapter 5 in the middle, uh, kind of halfway through verse 24, all the way through verse 34. Um, and so again, I want to encourage you, open up your Bibles with me and leave them open as we study God's Word together this evening. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garments. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up. And she felt it in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around him, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him, and told him the whole truth, and he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Pray with me. Father, as we open up your word this evening, I pray that your voice would be the voice in this room, that my words would be few, yours would be many through me. Holy Spirit, guide this conversation. Lord Jesus, be glorified in it, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So let's set the scene of these, these last two stories of Mark chapter 5. We meet Jairus, who is a leader in the synagogue near the shore of Galilee. Again, possibly Capernaum, which would have been where much of the previous stories have taken place. As a leader in the synagogue, he would have been in charge of worship. He would have oversaw the weekly Jewish school in the synagogue. He probably would have had some oversight taking care of the facilities. In other words, he is in charge of a lot of important things revolving around the religious practices of that town in or around Capernaum, most likely. That means he would have also been closely linked with the Pharisees who lived nearby, and he would have been significantly pressured not to associate with this Jesus. But Jairus realizes that his daughter is deathly ill, and quite frankly, he doesn't care what any of them are going to think. He's just going to give this Jesus a try. Even though his peers are literally conspiring to kill Jesus, Jairus doesn't care. He just wants his daughter to be okay. And he goes as so far as to bow at the feet of Jesus, right? He throws himself there. To every person in the crowd that day, this would have been a shock. To see a leader of the people who are standing in sheer opposition to this Jesus, literally throwing himself before him, astonishing. But Jairus really isn't there necessarily as a leader per se, but rather as a desperate parent. 
He just wants his daughter to be okay. It's a heartbreaking tone. Some of you know this story. When Karina was first born, we were all excited. We got home. The next day we went to the pediatrician appointment, and her body temp was dangerously low. And they rushed us, they sent us to the ER in children's, and, uh, which is not exactly a calm experience. Uh, we're being told that she needs to be, have a spinal tap for, to test for meningitis. She's three weeks early. We had just gotten home. It's that panic, frantic. They actually even forgot us for a little bit in the waiting room, which made things so much better. And there's this kind of unwritten rule when you're there, and we ended up being in the NICU for about five days until she was fully cleared. There's this kind of unwritten rule when you're a pastor and you're on vacation or you're on paternity leave in this case that you just kind of take a step back from the church, right? You focus on your family. You need to rest, Sabbath, whatever term you want to use. But I got to be honest with you, in that moment, we needed our church. We needed to be surrounded with prayer and encouragement. And if you're kind of new to this community, Elizabeth and I can testify to the people here. Um, Because we reached out and constantly, all week long, people lifting up prayers for us, encouragement. When we came home, meals provided for a couple couple of weeks. (laughs) Um, And so again, if you're looking for a good, if you're new to this community, that's the kind of people that are in here. Um, But in that moment, I'm not worried about my role as pastor and what is taboo and correct. I'm a parent, and I just need to know that my daughter's going to be okay. That's Jairus right here. He just needs to know that his daughter's going to be okay. And so he throws himself to Jesus, and the first scene ends with some very powerful words. And he went with him. This is Jesus that goes with Jairus. He went with them. It reminds me in Matthew 28 when Jesus commissions the disciples in the Great Commission. He says, Lo, I am with you always until the end of time. There is never a moment we are, with, we are without our Savior. It's just that gentle reminder in Jairus' story. When we're struggling, when we're suffering, He is with us. And this story so far seems right. All things seem to be right. Jesus is with Jairus in his suffering. He just healed a man of his demons. People are flocking to him again. Like, things just seem to be clicking again, right? But we get an interlude. In the middle of Jairus' story, literally en route to his house to heal his daughter, Jesus stops in his footsteps for another healing, another miracle. And it actually, the way Mark writes it, is going to cause him to be late. He, because he's going to stop and heal this woman, he's going to miss out on healing Jairus' daughter. And when you're reading this as a parent, like, especially you kind of can sense there's going to be a des- desperate tone here. Like Jairus is going to be like running really fast. They're going to be moving quick. They're going to be talking fast. They're just going to have a speed to it. And Jesus stops to heal this woman. And in typical Mark fashion, we're not given any details about her name. We have no idea where in route this is located. No mention of any surrounding details, who all is there. What we do get, though, is what she's been through. We get her story. She's had a blood discharge for 12 years. She has spent her life savings on it, and still there's been no healing. The doctors have run out of ideas. She's run out of money. She's flat broke. She's in pain. She's desperate, and so she literally reaches out to Jesus. She, like Jairus, again, will give Jesus a try. She, like the four men with the paralytic, they've heard stories of Jesus, and they're curious enough just to try him out for themselves. When's the last time you've been just curious enough to try Jesus out for yourself? When you've gone on, when you've struggled, when you've been through, when's the last time you were truly curious at what your Savior can do? But nevertheless, we're not told the name of this woman's disease. Based on the details we get, it's probably something in the menstrual family. And the reason why that matters is that would have made her ceremonially unclean. Which means she would not be able to go into the synagogue to be prayed over. No one could touch her and lay a healing touch on her because they would be made unclean then. Because everything she touched and everything that touched her would suddenly become unclean. And so here she is desperate. Can't be prayed for. Can't be healed. 
She's probably forced to stay alone, possibly kicked out of her family. We can deduce based on her problem she's childless. Probably means she's unmarried at this point, which means she is at about the lowest rung on the social class ladder in the first century. This is, a, this is an outcast of outcasts. And quite frankly, she really shouldn't be actually in a crowd of people because anybody she would have bumped into would have suddenly been made unclean. So this woman shows very little regard for Jewish law or custom, but she's desperate, and she believes Jesus can help. As one commentator puts it, her theology may be weak, but her faith is strong. I think for many of us, we kind of have an opposite problem like the Pharisees, where our theology is strong, but our faith is weak. Where we keep the intricacies of God up here, but when it comes to actually mattering, when it actually comes to putting it to practice, we're weak. And so in some ways, we can really appreciate this childlike faith that's unbridled, it's raw, and it's desperate for Jesus. Ideally, the hope is for all of us that as our theology grows, so does our faith. As our faith grows, so does our theology. They kind of become this symbiotic relationship. But nevertheless, I think a lot of us struggle there. But this woman, she's unclean. She knows that. She's desperate, and she reaches out to Jesus for help. Again, her theology may be weak, but her, her, but her faith is so strong. She reaches out, she touches Jesus, and she is immediately cleansed. He, and he actually feels like the power has gone out of him. And this touching should have made Jesus unclean. This should have made him unworthy to go into the synagogue and do worship. Yet, she's cleansed, and he's noticing what's going on. For all of us, this should remind us that our sin cannot even remotely weaken our Savior. Nothing we do, nothing we can literally carry with us will ever for a moment diminish the power of Jesus. He cannot be made even weaker. One of the most powerful moments in Scripture to me is when he's hanging on the cross. It doesn't say, and he died. It doesn't say he defeated. It says he gave up his spirit, which means to actually physically die, Jesus has to surrender his spirit to the will of the Lord. Unbelievably powerful our Savior is. For us, seeing that, we should then never allow our uncleanness, our sin, our struggle to keep us from reaching out to Him for help. He is not just our Savior when we die. He's our Savior here and now. He wants to deliver us from our diseases. He wants to deliver us from our struggles. He wants to cast out our demons. He wants us to get new life in Him. And He will notice And he will commend and celebrate our faith as he does with this woman. He notices the powers leaving him and he turns and he faces her. And he doesn't chastise her. Instead, he actually sends her in shalom. That's the word used here. Shalom, a complete wholeness and peace. She is now whole. She is now at peace. Someone who has been tortured for 12 years has a complete wholeness because of her faith in Jesus. And to go even further, he calls her daughter. In the healing of the paralytic in Mark chapter 2, he calls him son, an outcast. Someone who would have been literally dragging his life on the streets. Here's a woman who has literally spent her life saving. She's got nothing. And Jesus calls them son and daughter even though they may have been kicked out of their families, even though they may not have a a spouse and children yet, they've been adopted into the family of the Lord. What a beautiful moment this is. And this is an incredibly nice story. It's one of my favorite stories about Jesus. But what about Jairus? As Jesus declares this, somebody comes out and basically says, your daughter's dead and, and kind of is implying that man's to blame. If he would have been here on time, instead of dealing with that unclean woman, she, you, Jairus, as a religious leader, your daughter would have been okay. But because he dealt with a beggar and a woman on the street, your daughter is dead. But in typical Jesus fashion, he's undeterred by this. 
And he tells Jairus something so hauntingly, holily beautiful. Do not fear, only believe. Wow. Your daughter is dead. Do not fear, only believe. We could stop right there. That sermon will preach all week. But thankfully, Jesus continues. Despite the fact that the crowds mock his ability to raise this little girl, he sends them away, and he goes inside, and he takes with him only his inner circle, James and John and Peter. He's going to take them in so that he can show them his resurrection power. This is the natural next step in their discipleship. They've already seen him cast out demons. They've already seen him conquer disease. Now they're going to see him have victory over death. And here's the crazy part. This is the last miracle that Jesus is going to perform before chapter 6 when he sends them out to go heal the sick and cast out demons. He's going to give them one reminder of his power and his ability. It's the next step in their discipleship. They now need to see that he is going to be victor over death. And so he raises the little girl, and he tells someone, go get her something to eat. Seems kind of weird to us, but he also then says, no one, basically, no one tell this story. Here's why. He wants her testimony, her life, to show what happened in that room. She was pronounced dead. And she is sitting up, and she is eating. She's hungry. A sign that she's not a hologram. She's not a ghost. She's physically alive. He wants her testimony to be, as John said, to show that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. This little unnamed girl, this daughter of Jairus, this daughter of a religious leader, is now proclaiming the fact that Jesus will rise from the grave one day by the fact that she's sitting up and eating. Oh, if it were only that easy most of the time. But what about us? These stories are incredible. But what are we to take away? What are those things that that Mark wants us to noodle over as we study these? Well, I think there's four. The first is just that. Jesus is victor over demons, disease, and death. Again, the three Ds. I think the second thing is that his ways and his timing aren't always ours, but they're good. Jairus thought that his daughter would make it and not hit the grave point. Jesus had a different schedule, but he showed him something even greater. Not just can I heal disease. I can heal. I can, I can resurrect from the grave. The third thing is that he's never too busy to care for you. He is literally on a mission of mercy to help Jairus' daughter, and he stops and heals the woman with a blood discharge. He always has time to sit and be with his people. He is not too busy playing God and sitting on his throne and waiting for the world to collapse to sit and be with you in your suffering. And the fourth thing is it's actually, this is a call of invitation to join him in his ministry, join him in his work. Jesus invites the disciples, again, the inner three. He he brings them in as he raises Jairus' daughter. Again, it's the next step in their preparation for ministry. But he also takes Jairus with him to heal the unclean woman with a blood discharge. Jairus, a religious leader, due due to the purification laws, should not have associated with this sick person, right? We've already talked about it. He should have stayed away. Yet, literally on his way to heal Jairus' daughter, Jesus actually fixes Jairus' own theological shortcomings. He tells him that as a religious leader, he needs to spend time with broken people. Don't stay in the church. Don't stay cleaning up the facilities, cleaning up after the Jewish school is over. Get out on the streets with broken and sick people. Go heal them. Go care for them. There's an experiment that happened a few years ago in Princeton Seminary. And it's become quite famous because what happened was they told these seminary students that one of their final steps for ordination and graduation was they had to preach a sermon to these professors. And so they were put in a classroom to do their sermon prep, and then they were sent to go preach their sermons. Well, as they were leaving the classroom, they were given one of three possible statements. You're late, and you need to get over there. They expected you a few minutes ago. Or you're just on time, but you've got to hurry. You've got to get there. They're expecting you to start like right about now. 
or you've got a few minutes, you might as well go ahead and over there so you can get set up, quiet your heart, whatever, right? So these seminary students go, and on their way, they each encountered a beggar like the one in the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? Someone who's been beaten, looks shoddy, needs a lot of help, hungry, dirty. And little did they know that was the actual experiment. It wasn't their sermons. Here's the results of this study. Those that were told they were going to be late, 10% of them stopped to help this man. Those that were on time, 45%. Those that had a few minutes, still only 63% stopped to help this man. In other words, they were so focused on doing their Christian task that they forgot to take care of the beggar. They were so focused on even preaching the word, which is a good thing, they forgot to care for someone along the way. When we were in Dallas at the National Gathering, the last speaker most of us heard because we had to get on a plane early and so we left and missed one. But the last person that most of us heard was a lady by the name of Danielle Strickland who's out of Vancouver. And she was preaching and talking through Acts 27, which is the story of Paul's shipwreck. And she told it kind of this way. Instead of really freaking out about the fact that the ship is falling up to pieces, Paul just cared for the people. The ship is literally being battered and torn apart and thrown into pieces. And the story shows that Paul actually sits there and feeds people. And actually, if you look at it, he breaks bread and gives thanks for it, which is communion language. So as the ship is literally falling apart, Paul is offering people to come to the table. Instead of focusing in on the fact that the ship is tossing about, Paul loves and pastors people in that moment. So in other words, Jairus, don't worry about your reputation. Don't worry about what people say in the synagogue tomorrow. Just go and see Jesus heal that woman, and now go and do so likewise. Disciples, don't sit there and try to figure out the mechanics of how Jesus healed and raised the little girl. Just go and heal people. People of the narrative, don't try and plant a church. Don't try to multiply missional communities. Instead, just pastor and love people. Ironically, if we do that, we'll be amazed at what God does. If we focus on church planting and we keep pulling that and pushing that, we might plant a church. We might even multiply, and that would be kind of cool. But would lives actually change in the process? But if we focus in on sitting with the lonely, healing the broken, celebrating those in seasons of blessing, we can't not multiply. We can't not grow. That's just what happens. And so I'm challenging all of us not to get mixed up in little busy religious work like the Princeton Seminary students, but rather just pastor and love people. Let us change our metric of what it means to be successful in life as a disciple of Jesus. Let us not ask, how many people did you bring to church this week? How many people did you bring to missional community this week? Instead, let's ask ourselves, how many people did you pastor this week? How many people were you a minister of the word to this week? How many people did you sit with that were broken and lonely? Let's even change the way and make a goal to change the way we're doing our narrative stories and prayers each week. To focus in on the stories of what God is doing in and through us into other people's lives and the call for us to do more. The call and the need for him to do more through us. As we talked about last week, let's let our fruit hang on other people's trees. And as we come to the table in just a few moments, let us remember that we are all in our own shipwrecks. And the Lord invites us here, as Paul did. But let us remind ourselves that Jesus, on his way to do a good Christian thing and heal Jairus' daughter, stopped to be with a broken, outcast person. Someone that no one else was going to sit with. Someone that was hurting, that needed only the healing he could provide. And our statement uh, and profession of faith this week is going to be out of Philippians 2, which is this incredible hymn Paul quotes to talk about who Jesus is. He's going to call us to be like Jesus. In other words, stop and heal the woman with the blood discharge. Yes, go and heal Jairus' daughter too, but stop and heal 
along our way. Heal that beggar on your way to preach the gospel. And so I invite us in, in, to join together as preparation to come to the table, proclaiming the faith that we have in Jesus and who he is and the call for all of us to read together Philippians 2 as print in your bulletin. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Have this in your mind like Christ Jesus who though he was king of kings, sitting on a royal throne in heaven, hearing praises of glory and honor over and over again, still came and took the form of a servant and came to this moment, willing to nail himself on the cross so that Jairus' daughter could have new life so that the woman of the blood discharge could have her blood stop flowing by the flowing blood of Jesus. And so come in your own shipwrecks in life. Come in your own desperations. Reach out to Him. He wants to heal you. He wants to dine at this table with you. The night he was betrayed, the night he knew what he was going to suffer on your behalf, on all of our behalf, he took the bread and he broke it after giving thanks. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, the cup of salvation, poured out for the forgiveness of all of us. And he calls us to take and drink in remembrance of him. And so each time we come to the table, we feast on the bread, the body of the Lord. We take from the cup and drink of his salvation. We proclaim his death until he returns. And so I invite you to come forward. And we're going to take a piece of bread and dip it in the cup tonight. Again, reminding ourselves of the unity of the body of Christ and our own cleansing. So come. Come and be healed. pray. We thank you, Lord, for this table. We thank you for his healing. We thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice that we may be healed. Teach us to have the mind like you, 
to be willing to sacrifice it all, to sit with broken people, to be part of your healing ministry, to be unafraid and unashamed to reach out to you in our own desperation. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us sing our final song, our only song tonight, but our song, King of Kings. darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. To reveal the kingdom coming And to reconcile the lost To redeem the whole creation You did not despise the cross And for even in your suffering You saw through the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus for sake you died in the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. To the stones moved for good, and the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. In the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now the gospel, truth, the old, shall not kneel and shall not faint. In His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who is resurrected me. See, praise the Father. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. We sing praise, praise forever. To the King of Kings. This week, as you kind of step out of your comfort zone and you're sitting with broken people, and I hope you do, I really do, I'd love to hear those stories. But as you do that, know those powerful words out of verse 24, and he went with him. You're not going alone. You are actually going with the Savior, as we just sung about, who the tomb couldn't hold. You're going with the Holy Spirit who has spoken 
has lit the flame of the church to go until the end of time. You have victory. When you encounter broken people this week, you already have the victory over their brokenness, over what's ailing them, over what's causing them to struggle. Go. And God the Father, who sits supremely in heaven, who created you for this moment. God the Son, who gives you all victory, all healing. God the Spirit, who speaks in and through you, who calls you to sit with broken people. May they go with you today and every day. Amen and amen. Let's sing our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.